And our next speaker, I know so many lawyers who really want to be historians. And uh, very few of them are, are bold enough to come out of the closet and just do it. <laughs> but our, our next speaker, Robert Palazzo, indeed, uh, has, uh, has done so and uh, is not only uh, a prominent attorney, but is also a distinguished uh, historian. Um, he, is, uh, he has written on many diverse topics uh, uh, dealing with many aspects of world history as well as the history of the American West, the story of Death Valley, and its uh, fascinating history is one that has captivated him and, and uh, has several books out on, uh, on Death Valley. And he is a lifetime member of the Death Valley Natural History Association. He's also a board member of the Museum of Western Film History. And he's going to uh, speak to us today about Captain Jack Crawford and Buffalo Bill, similar but not equal. Robert. Hi, thank you for the introduction, Paul. Uh, I'm speaking today on uh, uh, Captain Jack Crawford and Buffalo Bill Cody. Strikingly similar, yet decidedly different. Uh, while virtually every person knows of Buffalo Bill, at least in this room, a few members of the general public have any idea that Captain Jack Crawford, the poet scout, existed, let alone who he may have been. Those who may know of Captain Jack probably put him in the category of a Buffalo Bill Cody wannabe, uh, one of the many imitators who affected the look, mannerisms, and backstory of Cody to try to capitalize on Cody's international fame, all with varying degrees of success. A Buffalo Bill scholars, on the other hand, have at least a passing familiarity with Captain Jack either from his appearances with Buffalo Bill on stage or from Cody's autobiography where he famously recalls Crawford uh, bringing him a bottle of whiskey from Cheyenne. Uh, Jack Crawford is the only man I have ever known that could have brought that bottle of whiskey through without an accident befalling it for he is one of the very few teetotal scouts I've ever met. There are surprising parallels in the lives and careers of both Buffalo Bill Cody and Captain Jack Crawford. While uh, time does not permit an in-depth treatment of all the parallels, uh, briefly they include that Buffalo Bill and Captain Jack were exact contemporaries. They were born a year apart, Bill in 1846 and Jack in 47, and both died a month apart in 1917. Both claimed their fathers died as of their uh, opposition to slavery as part of the uh, 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 Civil War movement that we just heard about. Um, Isaac Cody from the effects of being stabbed while making a speech against slavery uh, and John Austin Crawford from the effects of his wounds at the Battle of Antietam and again at Cold Harbor uh, while soldiers during the Civil War. Both Captain Jack and, uh, uh, and by the way, both uh, uh, made these claims and uh, uh, their biographers have uh, uh, questioned these claims uh, as well, uh, as we heard a little er earlier. Uh, both Captain Jack and Colonel Cody served in the Civil War, both as privates. Um, though Jack probably had the arguably a more distinguished uh, uh, service being wounded in action twice, uh, he was wounded at the Battle of uh, uh, Spotsylvania Courthouse, and again just before the war ended during the assault on Fort Mahone. Both served as chief of scouts during the Union Wars in which both scalped an Indian, uh, or both took scalps, depending on uh, the context. Uh, both uh, affected plains dress and appearance, long flowing hair, fringed buckskins, and Stetson hats. Both were partners for a short while with Doc Carver and Wild West shows. Uh, both used military officer titles in later life. Both were authors, both were stage performers, both had their own theatrical uh, companies. Uh, both were nationally known and acclaimed celebrities during their lives. Both had uh, marital problems due at least in part to continued absences while performing. Both invested heavily and lost heavily in Western mining ventures. 
both had financial problems later in their lives that prevented them from having a comfortable retirement, um, and the list goes on. Uh, despite these many similarities, and though Jack did achieve national fame during his lifetime, the question uh, remains why Buffalo Bill's fame has endured to the present day, while Captain Jack never became international star, and today is, is remembered, if at all, primarily for his association with Buffalo Bill. Uh, one of the reasons for why this uh, um, fame uh, eluded Captain Jack uh, could be uh, due to their physical appearances. Um, Buffalo Bill, according to some biographers, uh, and as best we can determine, was a fairly tall man. Uh, above average height, uh, possibly six foot, six foot one. Um, on the other hand, Captain Jack was only five foot four and three quarter inches tall. Uh, he uh, added to this is he also walked with a limp as a result of the serious uh, hip wound he received uh, during the Civil War. Uh, now, to his credit, Jack did try to mitigate this by including in, his, in the first biography a description from Edward L. Keyes, late lieutenant of the 5th U.S. Cavalry, uh, who misleadingly described Crawford as a tall, wiry man. <coughs> now, while Captain Jack and Buffalo Bill both appeared uh, on stage together, it was Jack joining Cody's uh, theatrical uh, enterprise, the Buffalo Bill uh, combination, rather, uh, rather than uh, Jack creating his own show. Uh, Jack's stage partnership with Buffalo Bill ended badly in Virginia City, Nevada uh, in the summer of 1877. Uh, when uh, Crawford uh, was playing the part of Yellow Hand uh, in a combat scene staged on horseback, he accidentally shot himself in the groin. Uh, Jack blamed the mishap on Cody's drunkenness and quit the show. Um, in, uh, it, it's instructive to note that the contemporary accounts of uh, in the newspapers of the time in the days after this and reporting this event, um, those do not support Jack's uh, uh, version of events. Now, after uh, Jack recovered, and possibly due to the uh, uh, attentive ministrations of the actress Gertie Granville, uh, pictured here, um, who had fainted uh, when she saw blood spurt from uh, uh, Jack's uh, wound, uh, he decided to continue his acting career, but this time uh, with his own acting troupe rather being, than being a part of someone else's. Uh, accordingly, he formed the Captain Jack combination. Note the similarity uh, with the Buffalo Bill com uh, combination. And perhaps this choice of name was intended um, to show the public at large, and Buffalo Bill in particular, that Jack could compete on the same level and that he was Bill's equal. Um, their respective nicknames could also have affected the public perception um, Jack, uh, Buffalo Bill is alliterative and conjures up a romantic image of an American frontier hero. Uh, Captain Jack is rather generic and boring, not to mention the fact that during this period, Captain Jack was also the name of a notorious Modoc Indian who was hung in 1873 for the murder of U.S. Army General Edward Canby. Um, there was also famous highwayman, uh, Jack Slade, who was also known as Captain Jack, uh, who was immortalized by Mark Twain in Roughing It. Um, there was also a possible confusion uh, with other Jacks, um, such as Texas Jack Vermillion, or as we saw earlier, uh, Texas Jack Omohundro, uh, another um, frontier scout and actor who was a member of Buffalo Bill's stage show, uh, though he predated Captain Jack in the show. Uh, even today, uh, a, uh, whoop, a, a, a Google search of uh, Captain Jack uh, will turn up the Billy Joel song of the same name <laughs> or uh, a Disney's Captain Jack Sparrow, and that will, uh, that they will turn up as uh, uh, more often than uh, Jack Crawford, uh, the Poet Scout, another nickname uh, equally uh, banal.
Uh, adding to the differences uh, between the two is that despite having been Bill's protege, Jack's frequent criticism of Bill with his uh, whiny complaints and his preachy tone and uh, his uh, bitterness can seem petty and ungrateful, uh, much the same as Doc Carver, whose legacy uh, is uh, not unlike Crawford's. Um, in my opinion, there are at least two major differences that can explain Bill's enduring fame and Jack's noticeable lack thereof. Uh, the first and perhaps most obvious is Bill's extraordinary uh, abilities to promote his image and career. Uh, today, more, uh, this is uh, known more popularly as branding. And I think we have a panel tomorrow uh, uh, on the uh, uh, people that uh, Bill surrounded himself with uh, in this regard. Um, the second and possibly more important is Captain Jack's view on alcohol and temperance, about which he would take every opportunity to expound upon, including but not limited to his performances on stage, lectures, readings, entertainments, writings, poetry and prose, um, ad nauseum. Uh, Buffalo Bill uh, had the uh, extraordinary instinct for self-promotion and marketing. Uh, not only uh, did he have this ability himself, but he surrounded himself with uh, experts in the field as well, and he took their advice. Jack had no such natural instincts and promoted his career more or less alone, acting as his own press agent. Buffalo Bill played to thousands in packed arenas, um, many times with standing room only. Jack performed in front of much smaller audiences in lecture halls and meeting houses. Even the shows themselves were radically different. Bill reenacted fantastic adventures in the winning of the West with large casts, lavish costumes, horses, stagecoaches, Indians, gunfires, shooting exhibitions, native tableaus, etc. On the other hand, while Jack uh, was uh, considering considered to be an outstanding performer, his entertainments consisted of talking, uh, uh, telling stories and uh, uh, reciting uh, often bad poetry, <laughs> his own. Uh, in fact, Jack denounced Wild Bill's, excuse me, Jack denounced Buffalo Bill's type of entertainment, calling it blood and thunder rot, which has ruined thousands of boys. And moving pictures of this kind are simply illustrated and thus more vivid doing all kinds of harm. Okay, so let, uh, uh, let's compare this with um, Walter Scott, who is a perceptive uh, cowboy performer in Buffalo Bill's Wild West, uh, who re recognized and appreciated Bill's abilities in, in uh, promotion and adopted quite a, a few of them uh, for, to uh, create his own famous and long-lived identity as Death Valley Scotty. Uh, for example, Scotty staged a fake ambush, an attempt to uh, scare away his, his investors from becoming, uh, 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 who were getting a little too nosy in, in trying to find out the truth of where uh, the source of the wealth and the mines were. Um, and uh, unlike with Jack, uh, when this staged gum fight went wrong, it was Scotty shooting his brother in the groin rather than himself. <laughs> Where, whereupon Scotty, without mini missing a beach, uh, beat, turned this mishap into the Battle of Wingate Pass, which received national attention from the press and further added to the legend he was creating. Now this is how an accidental groin shooting should be handled. <laughs> <laughs> also unlike Jack, Scotty was proud of his association with Buffalo Bill and was not jealous. In fact, here is uh, Scotty's room at Scotty's Castle in Death Valley National Park. And during his life, he had a big photograph of, of, of uh, Buffalo Bill on the wall, and it, it's still there. To bring the, the, full st the story full circle, uh, once Scotty achieved national fame, uh, Buffalo Bill even hired a Scotty impersonator in his Wild West uh, to come out of the audience and ride a Bronco. <laughs> a very good uh, example of the relative marketing abilities between Craw uh, Crawford and Cody uh, relates to their both taking scalps in the Indian Wars. 
Uh, Buffalo Bill recognized his opportunity uh, when he famously took the first scalp for Custer. Uh, sorry for the uh, uh, museum people that will, uh, this uh, is the scalp that used to be on display here. <laughs> um, uh, he, uh, Cody had the presence of mind to realize that this could be presented theatrically on stage, and he actually wore a stage costume in the battle so that when he performed in front of audiences, he could realistically portray himself in actual authentic dress. And to me, this uh, uh, begins uh, to uh, blur, if not uh, eradicate, the line between the mythical West and the historical West. Um, <coughs> Bill also sent the scalp home to put on public display, probably realizing the advertising benefits of doing so. Uh, in fact, as a, a testament to how effective this was, a uh, hundred years after these events, when I first visited uh, the Buffalo Bill uh, Museum, the scalp was still on display, uh, labeled the first scalp for Custer, Buffalo Bill killed Yellow Hand, a noted Cheyenne chief. Again, called Yellow Hand, there's the uh, question as to whether it's yellow hair or yellow hand. But the museum called it yellow hand back then. Um, when I saw it, I marveled at the exhibit, took a picture, told all my friends about it, and the memory of it is still firmly entrenched in my mind 40 years later. Uh, while Jack uh, endeavored to copy Bill's taking of a scalp, he failed to capitalize on it. Shortly after the Battle of Slim Butte, when Captain Jack wore a, wrote a lengthy, de lengthy description uh, for the Omaha Daily Bee, he described his own actions in that battle uh, in the third person. Your correspondent came near, near losing his hair on the afternoon of the fight in trying to get that of an Indian. He did get one top knot, however, which will be sent down to you for inspection. So while both Bill and Jack took scalps and both put them up for public display, the difference is that from the time it happened until the end of his life, Bill featured it in his stage performances and in his Wild West later. Um, coincidentally, uh, when Jack had accidentally shot himself on the stage uh, with Bill, uh, Jack was playing the part of uh, Yellow Hand in the uh, uh, play, The, the uh, uh, Red Hand. Jack, on the other hand, also took a scalp but refused ever to talk about it. Um, in a, uh, a lengthy article in 1915 that was otherwise very favorable to Jack, the, the reporter wrote, nobody ever heard of him on stage or elsewhere admit killing an Indian or a white man, even in open battle. And then the, uh, in this article it says, to many who are looking for the real thrills of stories of the famous Indian fights in which Captain Jack has taken part, this is the cause of a feeling of disappointment a feeling that they are not quite up to expectations, even as vivid and interesting as they are. Now, while we look at the, that as being somewhat uh, uh, negative, Jack looked at that as being a compliment. Uh, and he used that reprinted article for in advertising pamphlets for his talks. So you can imagine you know, someone wanting to experience the, the thrills of, of battle. I mean, because Jack did participate. He was in the Indian Wars. He, you know, he did uh, uh, these things in real life. He would talk about them, but when he would get to the part uh, about killing an Indian, it, it would be fade out. He, he wouldn't uh, mention it, wouldn't talk about it. Um, and so people were left uh, wanting more, or disappointed. So. Uh, his, Jack's reticence to speak about these events undoubtedly shaped the public perception of Captain Jack during his life and certainly thereafter. Uh, his Captain Jack's biographer, Paul Nolan, wrote, nowhere are there any accounts of any specific heroic acts that Crawford performed. Rather, he seems to have been a recorder of the adventures of others. Uh, biographer Nolan does acknowledge Jack's one moment of public glory where he uh, the first biographer of Jack, Lee Irvine, tells uh, a singular act, he calls it a singular act of brave, bravery, specifically when Jack carried uh, the uh, New York Herald's account of the Battle of Slim Buttes to Fort Laramie in less than four days. Um, a later Captain Jack biographer, Darlis Miller, describes Crawford as having played a major role in the Battle of Slim Buttes. 
while exciting, dangerous, and noteworthy, uh, Jack's actions are hardly the stuff of enduring legend. Uh, unfortunately for Jack, his extensive Indian War experience and heroism still could not compete with Buffalo Bill, who won the Congressional Medal of Honor for gallantry in action at Platte River uh, in April 1872. Uh, when Charles King wrote about the Indian Wars uh, in the 5th Cavalry Scouts in his popular book, Campaigning with Crook, uh, King's opinion of both Jack and Bill seems in tune with that of the general public at large when he described Buffalo Bill as a beautiful horseman, an unrivaled shot, and as a scout unequaled. He goes on to compare the various scouts uh, who had scouted for the fifth. We had tried them all, California Joe, Bill Hickok, uh, Crook's favorite, Frank Gouard, and we listened to Captain Jack's yarns and rhymes. They were all good men in their way, but Bill Cody was the paragon. Now, a very important example of Jack's inability to, success to successfully promote himself uh, occurred when he joined the Alaska Gold Rush. This was an adventure that should have set Captain Jack apart from Buffalo Bill, since Bill did not have a comparable experience. Uh, it was an event that captured the world's attention for several years. And unlike most other performers and personalities, Captain Jack was already uh, nationally famous as an entertainer, army scout, established poet, and author before he went to Alaska. Numerous participants became famous as a result of their Alaska experiences. Jack London, Alexander Pantages, Robert, Robert Service, uh, Sid Grauman, Tex Rickard, Klondike Cape, Scrooge McDuck, and many others. <laughs> Though he tried, uh, Jack failed to capitalize on his time in Alaska one, once again due to his lack of effective self-promotion and because of his constant sermonizing on temperance, both on stage and in print. For example, uh, when he reached uh, Lake Bennett, um, at the beginning of yeah, at the beginning uh, of May in 1898, uh, Crawford promptly made the acquaintance of Samuel B. Steele, the famous superintendent of the Northwest Mounted Police. Uh, he la uh, Steele later wrote that Jack entertained those present with stories of the Indian Wars and um, some of his exploits with Wild Bill Hickok. Um, and uh, Jack is in this picture. That's him right there. And, and you can see this is the type of room that he would play in. These would be the type of en ent uh, audiences he would be entertaining. Uh, this is a little more formal dinner, uh, but compare this to the uh, uh, outside show arena. Okay, uh, in, in Alaska, uh, uh, he wrote uh, an autobiographical play, uh, Colonel Bob, in which he uh, uh, promoted himself from captain to colonel. Uh, and uh, 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 in, in here we could see in, in his copy of the uh, uh, play, which actually did get performed, uh, that he said that uh, the most of the Klondike uh, uh, part was true. Um, now, his verse may appear painfully bad to some. Maybe he was just ahead of his time. If we examine the dialogue of the John w uh, Jack Wallace character at the end of Act Two in Captain Jack's play Fonda, it sounds as though it could be a modern day rap song. All right, Mr. Lowe, I'll give you a show, but I want you to know I cause you to blow before you can crow at any overthrow. Now give it a go, giving blow for blow. Now that's the motto of Captain Jack O. <laughs> Now, <laughs> uh, um, towards the end of his, uh, his life, uh, he did try to ha uh, capitalize. Buffalo Bill did a movie, Buffalo Bill in Three, Will, uh, in three Reels. This was produced. Uh, Jack uh, tried to have uh, uh, a story of his life, the uh, uh, Captain Jack Crawford story. But again, see in the promotional material to get it financed. 
It would make a strong temperance feature if directed with that point in view. It should be in demand by churches, schools, and all temperance organizations. Well, needless to say, it didn't get made. Um, the, uh, uh, he was a teetotaler, again, you can see here, toasting with a glass of uh, water, wine uh, um, uh, glasses down, and uh, this, this was a problem uh, for, for uh, people to, they just didn't care about him. Um, uh, my good friend's uh, grandmother was born in Italy in the late 19th century, when she was an old lady, uh, I happened to mention Buffalo Bill to her. She didn't speak English, by the way. Uh, her eyes lit up, and not only did she know who he was, she rec remembered seeing his show as a little girl in Trieste. Um, Captain Jack's entry in the Dictionary of American Biography may sum it up best. His work as a scout was highly uh, praised by his commanders. His verses, though popular in his day, even can, no spice, can by no stretch of courtesy be called poetry. Uh, even Captain Jack's biographer, Paul T. Nolan, was forced to admit Captain Jack is no Buffalo Bill. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Um, what's our time looking like here? Eight minutes for questions. If we, uh, if you have any questions, lunch is next. I can, I can hear the rumbling, roaring through the crowd. Can we bring the lights up a little bit? And then I, I hear. Um, my question is for for Robert. Um, I'm kind of curious about your argument that um, Crawford's temperance um, message was part of what made him unpopular since temperance was one of the great mass movements of the 19th century and um, the era around the turn of the century could arguably with the WCTU and other organizations like that be seen as um, one of the, the high points in temperance. So it seems to me like there was a market for temperance-oriented entertainment. Um, can you explain that some more? Yeah, it, uh, uh, my feeling is that um, the American public, when they're uh, uh, visualizing um, frontier heroes, uh, temperance doesn't fit in with that uh, uh, idea. Uh, and, and, and so I think that's what hurt uh, his image. I mean, again, during his day, he was nationally known. He was famous. He, he spoke to uh, Boy Scout tr uh, troops. He was he, uh, very well known, very well liked in demand. It's just it didn't pay a lot of money. Uh, and um, you put on a Wild West show, you rake in tens of thousands of dollars, you do a temperance talk, uh, you make 50 bucks. And, and so, so that's... Uh, uh, where I was going with uh, on that. That was my feeling. Uh, this question is for Jeff. Um, speaking of temperance, thanks for that. This goes right into my question. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and I may be wrong, but the Battle of uh, Summit Springs is where Ned Buntline purportedly met Buffalo Bill uh, and turned him into a star. Uh, actually, um, no, the, the battle was on uh, uh, July 11th. On okay. July 12th, they left, and in about four days, uh, uh, um, they got to uh, Fort McPherson, and Ned Buntline was there. Um, and so he was hearing the reports of the fight and all that. <coughs> actually, uh, uh, Luther North uh, raising the issue that it was about Wild Bill Hickok right. is good grounds to dismiss it uh, as being authentic. Um, while Bill Hickok wasn't around anywhere at that at that time, okay. Cody uh, was the talk of the town, so to speak, with what he had accomplished in that in that expedition. And Ned Buntline had him directly to talk to. So it was at Fort McPherson that they met, and then he did his publication after that. Okay, so that goes into the the meat of my question, which is um, in various accounts of that um, 
encounter between Cody and Judson, uh, it's always said, or sometimes said, that, um, is it Colonel North at that time or Lieutenant North? I don't remember his rank at that time. That, that he didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to talk about some of the things that had happened at Summit Springs. And because he was so reticent to do that, Judson spoke with Cody instead. Um, and I wondered if what really happened if North really just didn't want to talk to this guy who was just rolled in from California or? Well, I, I would take it that um, uh, th this is before Cody's fame. Right. Um, <clears throat> and he's got one focus and that's to do his job well. Mm -hmm. And he did it well. And so now all of a sudden he's getting uh, um, you know, with a, a, a correspondent and he sees the potential for that. Um, I, I think it was more out of shyness to talk about himself th than it was uh, uh, what you were suggesting. Got it. Thank you. In the back. Hey, Jeff. Uh, I just had a comment for you about your uh, presentation. And uh, I just wanted to say that I felt uh, a little bit discouraged. I, I know from uh, one but one uh, indigenous perspective I felt like you're really focused on trying to point out every single um, every single act of violence on the part of the dog soldiers people who are within their territories and uh, and had justified reason for action during that time and I felt like you're very preoccupied uh, with the actions against women and children without going into a balanced perspective and talking about the atrocities that I don't even care to mention at Sand Creek, which were perpetuated by soldiers, and also uh, the things that the 7th Cavalry did in their massacre of women and children at the Washita and the subsequent capture of those women and, of course, the accounts of the soldiers raping them. So um, I just, I just want to say that as you move forward and start working on this book, uh, you know, I think that it would really serve all of us in history and research if you consult with some uh, contemporary Cheyenne people, people from the dog soldiers um, that are still going on, and get some of those accounts and start listening to the other side of those stories. Uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, <coughs> it's a 20-minute presentation. It's very hard to give both sides of it to give an accounting. Um, the one thing, though, I would correct, there was no massacre at the Washita. Um, there was a massacre at Sand Creek. My great-great-uncle was at Sand Creek. Um, so I have family that was there. Uh, I've studied that uh, very, very much, and I've studied the incidents that led up to that. Um, there, there's a lot in that. Um, th there's just a lot of power in that. You, you have uh, good insight and wisdom that if, uh, uh, if I complete this uh, study on uh, Summit Springs, that there needs to be a balancing out of uh, the Indian side of it, and not just an emphasizing of the violence that was done by the dog soldiers. I, I appreciate that. I'd like to uh, add one point to that that ties in with what I was uh, talked about a little bit that I didn't, didn't get time to go into. Uh, Captain Jack actually specifically would not talk about killing uh, uh, Indians. He detested it. He said that anybody that uh, talked about it was, you know, promoting bad things. And I, I think that uh, that's one reason why he's not uh, known as much today, because that it, we're talking about a hundred and something years ago. There was uh, uh, the norms of society were different. And that's why when I, I had that s picture of the scalp that the Buffalo Bill took up, that hasn't been on display in the museum in a long time. And we are moving away from that, and society has. And, and and so you know, we are uh, trying to do that, and histories will as well. I have time for one more question. Uh, in relation to Susanna Springs, Summit Springs, um, I think it's worth mentioning that um, Jeff's very good book, Dog Soldier, Just Dog Soldier Justice, um, is one of the few uh, studies on uh, that period of conflict that does attempt to take account of the um, Cheyenne voices uh, in relation to that period. 
and that um, uh, in the section that's speci specifically about that fight um, does make the point that the um, Cheyenne people, the majority of their stories um, about what happened in that fight relate to the actions of the Pawnees uh, rather than uh, the whites. Um, uh, Carr himself, uh, in one of his um, uh, letters, does suggest that Tobul himself was killed by uh, an unnamed Pawnee. And uh, I have it from Linwood Tolbull and uh, the late Bill Tolbull um, that that is the story that's always been maintained uh, in their family. Um, and I think that uh, Jeff's uh, account of that fight um, is one of the best uh, that I've read um, and that it both emphasizes this strong oral tradition among the Cheyenne that it was the Pawnee who killed Tolbull, but also recognizes the fact that in Cody's autobiography, he's the only person who gives um, an account of the killing of Tolbull that names three of the four people um, who are um, sometimes uh, suspected uh, of being the culprit in the killing. So I do think that um, in fairness to Jeff uh, um, uh, and having read uh, his work, I thought it was worth pointing out that there is um, a, a genuine attempt to bring the Cheyenne perspective into the way in which he writes about uh, the events at Summit Springs when he has had the opportunity to write at greater length rather than just in a 20 minute presentation. Uh, thank you, I can add one other thing to that that just shows you the times. Um, there, w in, in Carr's report of the aftermath at Summit Springs, he said, following the Attorney General's orders, I went to collect the skulls the next morning of all the dead warriors but I was unable to find a single one because the Pawnee had pulverized them all. Well, I was struck by what is this Attorney General's order? And I researched it in the National Archives in 1868, he sent out an order to all of the forts that every surgeon will collect uh, Indian dead skulls, no matter age, sex, or, or, age or sex, and uh, will clean them and ship them to the Smithsonian for study. Um, this was part of the uh, 1973 uh, uh, Reparations Act to give back. They had tens of thousands of skulls. And think Darwin in 1850 in Origin of Species, and you'll understand what the culture was like back then. Uh, Professor Warren? Uh, the, the, I'm Louis Warren. and. And my reading of the reviews of the stage play, The Red Right Hand and so forth, where uh, Cody shows the scalp that he's taken, is that works in some places, and it decidedly does not work in others. And he puts it away when it stops working. In Boston, it's very unpopular. Uh, it is just going too far. Uh, he, it works in the arena, but there I don't think he's showing the real scalp. And in the arena, you're far enough away and it's embedded in this much grander story of Western conquest where there's a whole lot of violence going on. Uh, and he does repeat it in the arena in that sense. But it's one of those moments in his career where he's, he's very good at publicizing it when he can get away, when it helps. But when it doesn't, he puts it away. And I think Crawford went, goes the other direction, right, and says he's not gonna, not gonna pursue that kind of violent presentation. And Crawford makes all of those kinds of arguments about how this would, would be really bad. It's morally wrong and corrupting of young people in the audience to show this kind of thing. Um, Cody was very sensitive to those kinds of critiques too. He was just really good at, at deciding when and where it would work and, and playing it really well. But just wanting to say that the arguments we're having today about these events and their moral meaning are arguments that people were having at the time, right? These arguments have gone on a very long time, and they and they have to, and they do need they do need balance, right? They do need voices from all sides. I, I think that's that's really important. I just wanted to to thank the panelists as well. This is excellent.